Hello and welcome to a very special pre-Christmas edition of the Swim Brief. I'm joined by a uh, snow-besieged Joel Rawlings. How are you, Joel? Oh, my fro my screen froze. I'm well, sorry. We can hear you just fine, so just keep talking. I, okay, I'm sorry about that. All of a sudden, everything is frozen. Like joined by, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get slammed for something. I thought I was going to get slammed for the dramatic lighting I've got going on behind me, like this. Like, you yeah. know. No, but, okay. Good. All right. Hey, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm saying. I'm. I was just saying. Welcome to you. You're. Oh. I, know, I know you're um, dealing with uh, unprecedented uh, snow in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, yeah, we get two inches and that's it. There's a lot of people out here that work at, uh, for Intel and Nike. So there's a lot of people from Southeast Asia, um, Hawaii, places that they've never seen the snow before. And so uh, they continue to drive at accelerated speeds. Uh, they just don't stop as well as they think they should. And so it's like watching a Doberman Pinscher go across a linoleum floor. You know, they start running and they just slam in the refrigerator and just, what happened here? It's like it's the same linoleum we always had, dude. So, That's what sorry. people come to the swim brief for, for Doberman Pincher analogies. You can't get that kind of stuff on Brett Hawk's podcast. He doesn't yeah. ever talk about Doberman. He has Pinchers. a heck of an accent, though. You give it to him. That's right. That's right. I actually, I really enjoyed watching a clip of his podcast this week. I would like a, uh, for, for my own personal preference, I would like a Brett Hawk podcast where it's only him talking to other people who are obsessed with sprinting about sprinting. That's yeah. all. That's because I can tell his eyes light up in a different way. And he's just super excited. And um, I, I actually really like some of the things he has to say yeah. on that yeah, topic. Yeah. Um, so, no, he's a good guy. You know, It'd be interesting to watch the outtake where they, they talk like, you know, first week aerobic training. <laughs> like, yeah, so we did a set <laughs> of like eight 400s and I don't know. They kept going back and forth. And, <laughs> and I was so bored. <laughs> watch his eyes glaze over. And then, right. you go, and then you got two weeks to go and you're prepping for that 50. And then he's like getting get the veins coming out of his neck. That's fun. Yeah. Right. No, he, it's a right. good podcast. Yeah. I, I would like an interview with Brett Hawk's age group coach that just describes what it was like to have him at practice. You know, like that would yeah. be a good one as well. Right. I can't imagine young Brett Hawk was very enthusiastic about, you know, uh, 3K for time or whatever they were asking him to do <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. 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 Um, Anyway, that's not what we're going to talk about today. We got a few topics. Um, I want to talk about warming up, or is is warming up for swimming when we talk leading about with it? this? We, All right, do we even it. know what we mean? Yeah, no, no, we're going to get to that. Um, I made an announcement. Oh, uh, no, made my the thing froze again. Yeah, don't, Joel, just don't worry about your screen freezing because I can. Uh, hear it you goes just okay. Fine and All right. Yeah, everything everything's working. I, I we're having maybe some kind of connection issue, but remember this thing uploads in the background. So as long as you can hear me. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Talk. I, uh, well, okay. I couldn't hear you. I could hear my son playing Roblox though. And I can hear him asking for more money for Christmas for it. So, so yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. So it's so warming no up in, in the, in the pr procedures and things. I was, I was thinking about this the other day, um, about, um, I was listening to some podcasts on like neurobiology thing. So it was really, uh, nerdy stuff. And I was thinking like, how did I miss all this in exercise physiology? And they started saying that they didn't really start merging those things together until, you know, especially at undergrad level until like the 2000s. So after, well, after I was out, you know, and, um, and I was thinking about that as far as like, when you're getting into these warm ups, a lot of times coaches are just going in with the idea of like, uh, you know, they got a recipe. They're like, I've always done this. This is our meat warm up. This is what we do. And that's what I did. And, and so it's all the way back to whatever they did. And if, especially the worst part is if they had success with it once, that's all they need. You know, if they, if they hit it on red, they're going back to that table and they're putting money back down on red and not thinking about a lot of the mechanisms that go into this. And we were just talking about, like for you, for instance, you had to go to a meet like five hours away. It's a, a, a new facility. And we're not thinking about like the perception level. We're not thinking about... Um, What's going on as far as like going from a car ride or even basically like as a going from like a student or like, you know, a blob of goo getting shoveled out of their backseat of their parents' car and shoveled into the meat and like, here you go. And so I'm starting to think that basically you need like almost two or three different levels of warm. One being that you're warming a kid up from basically being like, in my case, I was at a university for, for a while too, being a student, sitting at a desk all day or studying all day. They got to warm up from being that into an athlete. 
And it's basically it, task transition, like, like right. moving from one task to another. Right. right. Especially like you know, perceptual field is just all like into their phones now. They're all hunched over. They're turning off their diaphragm. They're, they're leaning forward. Their hip flexors are, are just completely just not in use for the whole part of the day. And then we're expecting them to kind of get in and go and try to feel something like water. And so the idea would be like if you can transition them from being a student into being an athlete. So doing like a dynamic warm up, which is a likely a lot of teams do. Then going from a dynamic warm up, now they're kind of an athlete. Now you've got to be a uh, swimmer. And so then you get them into the water, get them swimming again. Um, and so I mean, that, I think that's kind of like the first basic level of, of a warm up. But then also like on, on an even a more primitive level would be the idea of like when you walk into that new facility and things. The idea that we take in so many um, visual cues, we take in so much of our surrounding that we have no ideas even there. Just because we're, especially these kids today, I, I'm not slamming them in any way. The way they can process information is, is astounding. I mean, they can have 18 screens going. I go into BW3 and I want to throw up because I'm like, I can't find them. And so anyhow, and it, that's the cat going down right there. And so the, yeah. um, so the idea is like they take in a lot of information they can be focused on you. They can be focused on the meat, but they're taking a lot of back inf background information. And so I think first step is just kind of getting them moving around the pool area, kind of taking everything in around them. Um, the idea that they, um, you know, just, just walk the pool deck forward backwards. Cause I remember at trials back in 2000, when they pulled the, when they pulled the flags out, uh, you know, for the cameras to go up and down the kid, like elite level swimmers were, were thrown off. You know, be like, well, you're doing freestyle. What does it matter? But, but that's the thing is all these things are behind them are gone now. And so one of those levels that we have when it's meant by primitive brain is the idea of like just kind of like an idea of safety uh, of like I don't know where things are anymore. I don't know the depth of the pool. Right. I don't know the depth of field of vision. And so I think kind of walking the pool deck and kind of opening up and doing the dynamic warm-up in different parts of the facility is a good way to start the warm-up. So it would be kind of like phase one, I guess. Okay, so we have we have transitioning from task. We have you know like sort of trying to get comfortable. I would say in your sensory environment, would right? Be the way right. I would probably sum up number two. Yeah. And what's number three? Well, part of that is is the the emotive part of it is is a coach. Where I was like, it's a pool. Just get in and go. You know, or like in a right. in um Hoosiers, ten feet. That's how tall the hoop is here. You know, back at Hickory, it's ten feet. It's like again, we know that. But again, on that right. subconscious level, or if you have like an eight and under swimmer or a 10 and under swimmer or a 21 year old swimmer that's never been swimmer before, um, you've got all these things that you put into the season as a coach. You know, I've been up all these mornings, I've been all these Saturdays, all these afternoon practices. And then something as small as like they don't know where the ready room or the bathroom is before their race is going to throw off a swim. And so again, just, just the real basic level, like that of phase one. So phase two, then you got to start. I remember we had Trevor Gray on a podcast. So, Maybe put to, yep. put a link to that. Um, it, it is a breathing <laughs> mechanism, but but that's the other part. Having the diaphragm muscle warmed up as well, uh, starting to do some deep inhalations, and you got these kids. Everyone has a different level. Uh, what they have of, of of basically optimal arousal. They call it in sports psychology back in the day. Where like for some people, you know, they are wired all the time, and so for them, it's like they're burning a lot of that adrenaline. They're burning a lot of their energy. They may need to calm down. And so that, that, that canned, like, let's go get him rah-rah speech is going to over excite some kids. And, and, you know, those kids that are low level, maybe they got to ramp up a little bit. And so using that breathing to kind of get them up for that next level. So the kids that are, um, that are naturally high strung, getting them to focus more on the exhales during this part, where, again, where they're starting to get in the water. So the inhalation to the exhalation ratio is going to switch a little bit. So they're more on the exhale calming down, bringing it down, starting to think that they're more like storing up their energy. The kids that are like just waking up low level, starting to do the inhalations a lot more than the exhalations. So not hyperventilating, but focus more on that, that nasal inhalation, trying to kind of warm up the diaphragm, trying to ramp up the, uh, the whole system. And so everything's a huge feedback loop inside of the body. And so they've got to start to elevate and ramp up and get ready to get going. And so whatever well, the, so I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I just, just sorry, I wanted to uh, interject something on that point because I was thinking even a different direction than warm up. Like, again, I've just had the experience of coming off a meet. Yeah. And um, 
I think many, many coaches are going to relate to what I'm about to say in terms of breathing at a swim meet. And that is you'll come out of a, a big swim meet like this. That's, you know, three, four day swim meet. And it feels like most of your kids have some sort of respiratory illness yeah. coming out the other right. side of it. Um, and, you know, I think there's, there's definitely, it's definitely worth planning for how little time can you actually figure out to get the swimmers that you need to like, you need them on the pool deck to compete. Of mm -hmm. course, you right, need right, them right, on right. the pool deck, probably doing some of the other things you mentioned to prepare, but do you need them on the pool deck, you know, for like some of these club meets to 10 hours right. in a given day, right. breathing poor air quality? I mean, right. Because accumulatively over that time, yeah, that can, that can work its way up to a lot of distress and nobody's going to perform at their best when um, something as fundamentally life-giving as breathing is a problem for them. And it right. seems like yeah. a lot of these swim meets just systematically, right. like they're not built for you to, to be able to breathe free and easy right, right. <laughs> by day three, if you've been hanging out there 10 hours a day at the pool. Exactly. And, and that's where I was starting to think about this idea of the warm up. And so I'm mean, not really finalizing it. So it's kind of like us just talking it through here is, yeah. is before we, so kind of using that warm up, warm down in between the parts or the sessions too, getting them away, but also being able to kind of bring them back to it. Because again, like we said, they're, they're a lot of them are on their phones and, um, right. or, or they're out in the hallway and then they've got to all of a sudden go from that. All of a sudden there's a lot of environments, a lot of going on and set so to ramp up their activity level again. And there's not enough space for that. And so when they go to their phones, uh, what I've been reading is again, it's just all the scary things that come from when your phone. So the smaller the perceptual field you have, the more you're zeroed in on that phone, the more that everything else kind of starts to turn off. And not only that, but also I guess what we have on a, inside of us is your body is going to detect when all of a sudden CO2 levels start getting a little bit higher. And so you do these, um, these sighs where all of a sudden you just, just naturally take a deeper breath than usual. And, and when you sit there, sometimes you'll also know, so yeah, you just naturally take this deep breath. When you're on your phone, it turns that off. And so CO2 levels can actually kind of build up a little bit more on that. And so again, you're turning off everything around you. And so they have to, you know, disengage from that phone. And so this is a good time for the coaches. Like, listen, it's, it's not about, you know, it's, it's not like being a mom or dad here getting off the screen. It's like, this is actually, if you want to swim your best, get off the phone, you know, have it for music, but don't be looking at that. Um, so, but, but back to that initial warm up, the idea is like, again, so you've done your dynamic warm up, you've done your breathing, you, you've moved around the facility a little bit, you found everything like that. Um, getting into the pool, the next thing is we think, okay, right, you hop in the pool, you're starting to warm up. You hop into the pool, your capillary beds are immediately going to shut down because you're going from pool deck is going to be like 86, 88 degrees, 100 percent humidity. All of a sudden, you're in 78 to 80 degree water. Everything shuts down, and some of these kids that are super thin get super cold. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I'm I'm just laughing. I'm thinking of a story you've probably heard it too, uh, secondhand from Milt Nelms being at a swim meet once. And he had an engineer uh, sitting next to him and he was like, oh, well, I'm going to go take the kids and I'm going to get them in the water and warm up. And yeah. the guy was like, yeah, what temperature is the, the water in the pool? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, it's probably 78 degrees. And he goes, well, then you're, you're not warming up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the human body's 98 degrees. You're putting it fully submerging it into an environment that's 78 degrees. Like it's a, it's a complete counterfactual that you're saying this is warm up. Right. Right. Know? Yeah. And, um, that I got to give that guy credit. He's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like in, when, when we talk about the pure literal definition, physiologically, like warm up the idea of actually raising body temperature right. to help with performance down the line, it seems uh, completely counterintuitive. And I, now I still understand why it has a purpose in swimming right. because, you know, because that uh, we talk about all that other transition, like it is, hard to make that transition from being on land into an aquatic environment and the, 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 the feel of what you're doing. But at the same time, yeah, you do have to consider the fact that like, that, as you say, you're taking, you're taking somebody and the first thing you're doing in your warm up is cooling them off. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and I've been thinking a lot about that. It's like, so yeah, now all of a sudden they've gone into cold water. There's a lot of waves because the warm ups are always like overcrowded and, and they got waves yep. hitting them at different things. And so now they're getting hit in the face with it. So again, their anxiety level is going to go through the roof sometimes. 
Um, but, right. but, but yeah, you're ex- exactly right too, is, is that, um, like a lot of times when, when, uh, like Milton Elms or Bill Boomer would drop the aquatic environment, people would like kind of tune out a little bit, like, ah, here it comes again. But, but it right. is, you're, you're going from basically everything is being solid around you. You know, you're walking, you're pushing off, you're doing whatever, and then you drop into the water and everything's a lot more subtle, you know? And so some kids can get that feel for the water really quick. Some really need a long time. But yeah, I, I think what we've always done is kind of in our swims, like kind of start to get after it. Cause like, like you've been kind of alluding to the, the internal muscles need to start getting warmed up. You need to re- really get the blood moving through the, jo- the joints, the ligaments, the tendons, they all need to be primed up. And so hopefully the dynamic warm up provided a little bit of that, but now you've got to transition that back into the pool and getting used to the, you know, just the walls, getting used to the turns, getting used to where the, how the flags are, especially outdoor pools, flags might be blowing in a little bit or the sun or whatever it might be. I heard there's sunlight at least. I haven't seen it in four months. So um, I'm assuming the sun still is out there. And so, yeah, they, uh, they've got to get used to a lot of different things. But, yeah, I would almost say, like, instead of having that massive group, the whole team in there, you know, if you have, like, a 30-minute stretch in the pool or whatever you're allotted sometimes, I'd rather break the groups up, you know, and just have some kids get after a warm-up and go hard and do a little bit more dynamic and just get as much as they can out of the water. And then kind of get them out of the pool, dried off quick so that they kind of retain some of that heat rather than going right back to, you know, 78 degrees. Yeah, I have the I have the the critique of this running in in the back of my head, which is the same critique when I when you reference like when I have Trevor Gray on here and he comes on and he goes like, hey, you know, actually, if this is what you're trying to achieve, this is what I think the ideal way to do it is. Um, and I have this rest of mind, of course, because I have been um, coaching club swimming that like, yeah, probably all the stuff you just said makes sense. And if I'm listening to it as a club coach, I go, oh, so cool. Three times as much work for me in warm up. I'm already yeah, like yeah. at the end of my rope, just tr- just trying to marshal 50 kids to warm up for this swim meet. Right. Like now I have to organize them into 30 minute blocks and I have to trust, you know, like this, that, and the other person. And I say that not as a critique necessarily you have to respond to, but I do think sometimes we, uh, my counterpoint to it is we lose sight in swimming of, we just have a way of doing things that yeah. has been a compromise. Right. right? We just right. gone like, right. well, you know, we need to pay for the swim meet. So we're going to have 2000 swims yeah. in this swim meet over the weekend. Cause that's the way the economics of it work. And I'm going to think about like, is that a good experience for kids that do the sport of swimming? We just like, well, that's just how it is. Right. You know, and we haven't thought necessarily um, about some of the stuff that I think you're bringing up here because most people, again, probably would just have the reaction like, well, I don't have the staffing to do that. Or yeah. I don't like, how am I going to pull that off? You know, your fantasy land uh, stuff. So I think you, it, you're it's, dead uh, on. I hear that from coaches all the time too. Anytime I suggest something like I've got 40 ass, how are we supposed to do like, you know, the, the boomer posture floating? Again, I, I get it. And I looked at everything. Um, when people do things like, uh, they'll be like, Hey, what do you think about this? This novel exercise? I'm like, great. And in my head, I'm thinking it looks like it's about 10 minutes to set up. You can get three people in that one station, like a climbing wall. Climbing walls look right. awesome at schools. You're like, all right, so it's going to cost how many millions? You're going to need three people with harnesses, and you got a line of 40 people. And they get, again, it's, it's just the practicality of a lot of things that become suggested. That's what I think is what you said what is exactly right, is understanding what are you trying to accomplish and just break things down. And I think a lot of times, I, you know, as a coach, I didn't start doing that for a long time. With like, what am I really trying to – what are the mechanisms behind it? It's kind of like the idea of, you know, are, are you going to be a cover band where you're just like, whatever the song is, I'm just going to play that song. Or you're going to become kind of a musician where you're like, you understand the mechanisms in place and start to do it out yourself. And so I think a lot of times too, especially as a young coach, you don't want to look foolish like, oh, I don't know this. Uh, let's just 800 swim, 1250s, I am transition, 400. You just you grind out whatever you did. And I think it becomes the default becomes what we know or what worked for us. And I think that becomes the worst. But exactly what you said was the idea is like, what are we trying to accomplish in the warm up? And just stop and think about that. And if you have 50 kids and they're all at once and you have no way of hurting them, then I get it. You know, again, there, there's a lot of things I think we can just take out of a different warm up and go, well, what, what would be even more effective? What's going to give you the most bang for your buck? You know, I've seen some teams where they, they kind of elect team captains where 
This group will be re running a dry land. This group will be doing this or this. Again, whatever is effective for your team or the maturity level is, is what you have to go with. And it is. It becomes like a, like an, an emergency zone <laughs> where you're like, you just listen. The, the, the bus got hit by a truck. I'm just trying to save as many lives here as possible. Get everyone going. Um, right. But, no, I, yeah. I, I, I think an important part of this as I'm listening to you too, though, is that – um, I think many of us, you know, you'll, as you sort of rise up, um, in the ranks in coaching, if you get to sort of a more prominent, uh, coaching position, you will get more resources right. to do things. And sometimes we're looking upwards. We go like, well, if I had that guy's resources, like, yeah, I'd probably be able to coach some Olympians too. But do you know what you would do with the more resources? Right. Or would you just do what you're doing now because you haven't really thought about what you would do, right? <laughs> like what you would do differently if you had more and yeah. you don't want to end up as a coach, as like the dog who caught the car going like, well, I don't have enough resources to do the job. I don't have enough resources to do the job. Oops. I got the resources. Uh, I guess we'll do more of what we're already doing. Like, you know, yeah. like, you, you gotta, you, you do have to be thoughtful. You do have to have to have some idea of, yeah, what we're doing right now is not ideal. And I know what ideal looks like. Oh, they that's perfect. Yeah. Do. Yeah. No, very yeah. good point. Yeah. I think one of the things that really helped me as, as a coach, not that also I became Eddie Reese. I'm far, far from that. But, but what helped me to start was uh, my first group was, you know, that, you know, basically everyone's introductory, the senior prep group, you know, is your first coach, you're leading that group and you're saying to the senior coach and the senior coach would be like, well, we have a six lane pool. You're 40 kids. You'll be in these two lanes. And then some days like we're running a set over here with our two kids. You have to move over to one lane. And it wasn't like, well, I can't do it now. It's like, you right. still have to do it. And so just, all right, let's redesign this workout so 40 kids can get a, a workout in one lane. And understand, is it the best workout now? But it's going to be the best we can do today. Or the, the next pool I worked at, the, the main drain went out. And all of a sudden, we had to go to a YMCA pool that we were allowed two lanes to four lanes. And water basketballs, we were hitting kids in the head. And the water was 88 degrees. And so, you, again, you always have to be able to compromise but you i think when you understand the mechanisms behind what's going on a lot of these things is what allows you to adapt the, the quickest and, and so back to the idea of the warm-up i've been thinking about was again whatever you have for your group the idea that again that their breathing is one of the most important things obviously so when they're sitting there and staying engaged and understanding what they're going to be like at the end of those three-day meets uh, with, with the air quality that you have getting them in getting them out keeping them kind of either ramped up or ramped down and understanding it's like you know, one size doesn't fit all. And so if these kids kind of know where they're at like that, uh, you know, during their, their sessions when they're sitting out, maybe going through visualization in their head, you know, they have to lay down, turn on music and things like that, but starting to think, what happens if your goggles break behind the blocks? And so you start running through worst case scenarios and best case scenarios with kids. And this is, this is your area of expertise. And that's why I'd be interested in kind of bringing this up with you. If, if you kind of run through like, hey, your goggles break behind the block, what are you going to do? So they start to kind of go in a safe environment, worst case scenario versus all of a sudden this has never happened and they freak out. So I think even by thinking it through uh, one time, it, they, they at least lay the groundwork or a library in their head of like, what would I do if it, if it did happen? I could, I could do X, Y, or Z. And so kind of creating that template for them where they're not going to freak out. Because you got 50 kids, if you start kind of like, in a sense, decentralized command where they start going, listen, you can go to the bathroom on your own figure that out. You know, you can fix your goggles on your own, figure that out. Right. Um, right. But, but doing that in, in a safe environment, letting it ramp up so that when you're at, you know, trials, when you're at nationals, when you're at whatever the LSC championship meet is, hopefully a lot of that's taken care of. Cause again, you're only the you're only guy in the deck. Maybe you got a coach's meeting and you're at, and now all of a sudden your kids are freaking out. So again, if, if they have like a warm up in place, if they've got some thoughts as far as like what they're trying to do, as far as using their breath, either to ramp up for an event or bring themselves down a bit. And so, like I mentioned before, if they're ramping up, you know, really kind of doing those couple of deep breaths and just feeling energized, opening up, you know, their visual field, um, getting more of a perspective on, on, on the meat starts to kind of prep them mentally and neurally for the event. Or if they're a really high strung kid, you know, it's just slowing, calming the, the breathing down. But I think a big thing is not wearing the hoodies, not pulling the park over their head the whole time, where again, where it turns off their perceptual field and all that information going on around them. So they're kind of going from like, nothing's moving, they're just looking at their phone, to all of a sudden you take it off, it's like kind of like, you know, when you walk to a baseball game, you're coming out from the, coming out from a dark tunnel, and then all of a sudden you see the green field and you see all the people. It's, it's, 
it's, it's kind of one of the cool things about going to a stadium, but if you're getting prepped up to swim, that's not a cool thing. Or all of a sudden, here's the pool and there's screaming and yelling and everything it hits you at once. And so, um, yeah. so laying that stuff out again, you, you, you train, we work so hard to get these kids to swim fast. And then like, oh, the kid had had a bad burrito that morning and, um, you know, showed up late for warmth and all these things are just like, you know, and, and when we put so much on that one swim, we're now like, yeah, was nine months of work shot down because you didn't prep for 10 minutes. And that was always right. the worst feeling where like, it was just so aggravating. You're like, I know this isn't a bad taper, but that's what they're going to say. It's like, this is a bad taper or right. my training was terrible this year. It's like, dude, you didn't warm up. You didn't do what yeah. you're supposed to do. It's like, and I get it. I don't want to get in the water when it's 78 degrees early in the morning. I get it. It's like, but it's like the simple thing isn't always the easy thing. Yeah. I, I you know, so a couple of things I was thinking about as you were saying that, and maybe we're just going to end up uh, riffing on this the entire time, which, yeah. uh, you know, I think is, I think is, is wonderful to be All honest. Right. Okay, good. Um, good. I was worried this there, whole time. Like I got nothing really other than this. But no, no, no. But there was, there was something that you referenced in there that I think um, is actually a really important point that I want to pull out. And you're talking about the fact that like, yeah, have a conversation like about your goggles breaking behind the blocks or have a conversation about like bad stuff that might happen. And I think somewhere along the line, like certain ideas really get grooved in and they become like sort of psychological um, laws of, of sport. And they go like, this, this is how it is. And one of those is the idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you admit that something bad might happen in the future, right. you make it more likely to happen somehow, yeah. which is like, to me, kind of a weird mystical belief, like, um, on some level. Yeah. Like, yes, your thoughts about what happened do affect your per perception of the future. That piece of it is really true. But the part where you just go, we're not going to talk about anything bad that could happen because talking about bad stuff that might happen makes it more likely to happen um, is, I think, insane. Because yeah. then what you do is, yeah, you don't prepare and you you end up in a situation where uh, stuff hits the fan and right. you you could very easily see yourself or even an athlete just melt down in that situation. And then you go like, Oh, they weren't prepared for it. Well, you didn't prepare them. Like, <laughs> right. It's not like you're, you're going, okay, here's the worst case scenario. And now you imagine yourself right. melting down. You picture the worst case scenario. And how do you come through on the other side? <laughs> you know, right. I think that that's, that's the part again, the, the, what you just said there, I was just thinking about how, like, you know, every time the Packers lose now, it's like, well, there's one less, you know, item of clothing I can wear anymore. Cause I'm influencing them by the color of my shirt that day. You know, that kind of a thing where, right. where we, we t I think when you create these rituals or you create these images in your head and how you're getting through it, you're creating a plan and it, putting it in place and giving them something they can control. You know, again, if, it, yeah. if it's like, uh, uh, whatever the ritual, as long as it's not so elaborate, you know, where they have to walk around backwards 40 times or something, where if I don't get that done, it's going to fail, but creating rituals where again, you, you see yourself succeeding. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what to do right in any kind of stressful situation. You're not trying to come up with it in the moment because any kind of stressful situation, you're going to be upset. It's going to completely shut down the thinking part of your brain. You're not right. going to come up with a plan in the yeah. moment. You won't. So you, you, you better have it ahead of time. Cause then you go, uh, you go highly emotional when you don't have that. And once you're an emotional, then sure. everything's out the window. Again, it, it goes that primitive brain of, you don't see future. You don't see past. You just see, this is the present. And like, you need to either escape or fight, you know? Um, and, yeah. and I was thinking about that afterwards, kind of the warm up. We, are, we never talk about kind of the, the warming back down part. And I, I worked, um, Worked at Elmbrook Swim Club when I first started coaching. Uh, great program. Uh, Fred Russell was the head coach. Brent Bach was the uh, age group coach. Brent's now the age, the head coach, doing great stuff. And, and they're uh, doing amazing stuff. They, right they really are, they're yeah. Amazing. And uh, Fred was uh, did, I think, two tours in Vietnam, and he was a special ed teacher. So this guy, he was, like, really wow. organized on things. And what, what, he would, what he would say after every event and stuff, he told me was, basically, they need to know the war is over. So to, you always have them kind of debrief, but also he recognized that after they get done with the swim, good or bad, it's an emotional time. And so they need to kind of recognize that emotion. You're, you're doing great. You're celebrating. Now get in the pool, warm down. 
you disappointed? Yeah. We'll talk about getting the warms, but but allow them that chance to kind of, you know, know the war is over. Um, so many times, like let's talk about that bad swim right now. I got to find out what happened. It's like let them right. process and let them deal with it. Or their good swim, as we mentioned before uh, on one of your previous podcasts, about the idea that um, you know we, we keep on going. Oh, that was so good. You could have gotten tenth of a second faster. If you, and again, we start to already put a cap on that. And and this is again right. your area uh, of like. You know, are we resetting their goals? Are we like not allowing them to stop and kind of like smell the roses in a sense? Are we just kind of burning right by that goal? But yeah, getting it so great. You've done this. You've done the swim. Start warming back down again. And by warming down, literally going like 70 percent effort for, you know, 14, 15 minutes minimum. The idea is, again, once they get out, now it's in their cold to get back into a cold pool. Capillary bed shut down. Blood gets shunted back to the organs, which, you know, helps a little bit. But also the lactic acid can get kind of trapped in some of those muscles. And so at 70%, you need to start to bring them back down. And so now emotionally, they're going to kind of deregulate. And in the water, they're going to start to, like, again, flush through the physiological things, get that, get the lactic acid moving through so it can be converted to fuel again. And then coming back out and maybe, again, using that breathing to, to bring back down, calm back down. Right. And, again, understanding that the war is over because we always think of, like, our sport, our event. And we don't think that the body's basically like a hunter gatherer tool. You know, it's like you were like, literally we always talk like you get in a fight out there. And so if they really yeah. were in a fight, they're still ramped up, you know, adrenaline's right. going, muscles are still active. Everything's hyper-focused, hyper-active, hyper going. And we're like, great, let's try to keep that going. It's like the body's not built to, to sustain that. The body's melting. No. Go, okay, come back down, relax, and then build yourself back up through the whole process of warming up again. For sure. Yeah, I want to use that as an opportunity just to transition a bit because um, I have an opportunity here on the podcast. One of the things I like about the podcast versus other forms of social media is we just like we've just done for the last half an hour, you get to talk about stuff a little bit more in depth. So I announced on social media yesterday that as of January 1st, I'm no longer going to be a coach um, at Jersey Wahoos. And that's because I am transitioning um, to working full-time as uh, Chris DeSantis coaching, which I was doing full-time uh, prior to working at Wahoos. And um, I have continued to do some of that. People who listen to the podcast um, have heard a little bit about pieces of it. Um, you've probably heard the excitement in my voice sometimes when I'm talking about topics and stuff that I'm doing in there. And um, I, I think, you know, also this decision probably fits into some of the themes that um, we've, we've been discussing on the podcast. I think, you know, we have talked a lot about uh, the profession of coaching and where it is at the moment. And I, you know, like without getting too much into specifics, I do think there is an aspect of this that um, is, is just points to the challenges of the coaching profession in 2022 overall. Um, because I think if you look at it on its face, I had a, um, amazing swim coaching job at one of the best swim teams in the entire world. Um, and I decided to walk away from that. Now the, the, I, I view frame that mostly positively. Like, I think I have an even greater opportunity that I can go out there and, uh, and seize. So, you know, I, I, I felt like I was going to be doing myself a disservice if I didn't do that. I, I, I thought about it a lot from the perspective of leading by example, you know, like here I am as a coach, I'm showing up to practice every day. I'm telling kids, um, I'm, I'm trying to get kids to believe in themselves, to, um, believe in their potential to do things, to, uh, sort of reach for the highest level of achievement that, is in front of them. And, and I, I, I started to think more and more like that I was compromising a bit on that myself in what I was doing. But, um, I think also just want to take the opportunity to, cause I think listeners to the podcast have heard me, um, say any number of things about Jersey Wahoos throughout this. And I am really, really grateful for the opportunity that I got to coach at, at Wahoos. Um, I started there in September, 2020. 
And, um, you know, we, we were, we were at, uh, probably peak pandemic. Um, it had been a long time since I had really been full time on the pool deck. Uh, people who listen to this podcast know also that, uh, prior to that sort of my last full-time coaching job was a job I got fired from. So, you know, there was a part of me as I've reflected on this in the last week that kind of felt like I'd had my life's, um, my life's professional goal up to that point, which was coaching swimming. Uh, I'd had the decision to end it made for me instead of being able to uh, decide to do that on my own terms. So I'm really, really grateful um, for uh, Paul Donovan, the head coach of Wahoos, who gave me a chance to coach again and um, has been really, uh, has taught me so much over two and a half years. Um, you know, I got exposed to a ton of stuff. I mean, probably the most obvious example that people have heard about on this podcast was, you know, I went from the guy who was running a pure USRPT program um, <laughs> over in a foreign country to um, probably, I would argue, we're one of the highest volume swim programs in the world, right? And, and I believe in both of those. I believe that there's a way to make both of those work. Um, so it was amazing for me to get the experience of, you know, not just sticking in one religion <laughs> for, for life. I got, uh, I got exposed to a whole new faith system and learned how some stuff works. Um, and I think I'm always going to be better at everything that I do because of that. Um, and I think Paul uh, really helped me over two and a half years. He was a guy who um, always asked a thought provoking question. He's provided a lot of topics for this podcast just by sitting next to me and been like, Hey, what about this? You know, like you guys should talk about this. Um, and uh, hopefully he won't stop doing that. Even when I'm, I'm not a full-time employee um, of, Wahoos anymore. Uh, it's been on a personal level. I, I texted this to you, probably a pretty tough week. Um, swimmers have just found out that this is coming out on a Friday and they found out, uh, on Tuesday. Um, and I've been filling in on some other practices. So I actually haven't been with the group of swimmers that I normally, uh, coach. So I went to see them on Wednesday night and somehow foolishly thought I could be there for 15 minutes. And, you know, I would give a little speech and say goodbye to everybody and leave. Um, and uh, there were a lot of tears. It was, it was an emotional moment um, and a reminder to me that um, coaching, one of the most amazing things about it is that it's, uh, it's really personal work. It's, um, you get to be really involved in people's lives and you get to make a huge impact on their lives. And um, that's another thing that I'm really grateful for. And uh, I guess the final page here that I'm gonna turn is that I'm just super excited um, to be putting all my energy into Chris DeSantis coaching. Um, of course we'll sort of talk more about what that means. Um, probably, uh, organically here on the podcast because, you know, my experience will change. So the things that I will bring to this podcast will quite naturally change. Um, hopefully, you know, listeners to this won't feel like it's a, uh, that, that they're just listening to an advertisement for Chris DeSantis coaching, but, um, I think there's a lot of stuff that I've been working on in the background here that, uh, that we've touched on that I'm pretty excited, um, to get it. And that's, that's probably another piece. If I'm, if I'm thinking out loud of two and a half years, um, I think, it, you know, when you, when you, when you work as a, uh, as a consultant, which is what I was, um, one of the biggest challenges is keeping in touch with coaching, you know, because you're not doing it day to day necessarily anymore and empathy for what the coaching profession is, is kind of, um, one of the most important skills you can have. Um, so to, to reinvigorate some of that and, uh, especially in the American club environment, which I'd never worked in before, amazingly this whole time that I was coaching swimming, I'd only been a club coach in a foreign country. Um, so that's the end of my rambling, uh, no, that's ramble good. about yeah. what's, what's going. I, I think that I empathy is, is an important part of it. You know, obviously empathy is important, but I'm saying empathy with coaches because it's such an odd profession when you think about it. You know, you're, you're up at five or whatever, four, or, you know, running two practices. Then you have nothing going on during the day. Well, nothing in people's eyes. And that's the thing. No one sees you right. do stuff. So like, 
well, you work yeah, two people... hours in the morning and two hours from six to eight, and like they don't understand everything that goes on between. They don't understand right. that in between all the work that you're doing there, just setting and prepping and writing workouts and, and all the training, but then also, like you said, involved in their lives and, and, the, and the toll that takes. And I, I think from the outside looking in, people never understand. You always have parents, well, you're working four hours a day and you're playing with kids. And they don't understand at all, you know, the calls you get or, or the, the, the talks that you have that are unbelievable. And it just, again, a little bit more out of you. And, it, and it's hard to, to walk away from something like that, too, um, because it is. It's, it's, you know, part of it's kind of like a drug. Like, you, you are very important, you know, even, even though, in the, you know, in the grand scheme of things, because we're so insulated, we don't see the big picture all the time. We see everything that's going on in our pool as the big picture. And, and being able to step back and get perspective sometimes is hard to do, but also it's such a big part of our identity because we swam and then all of a sudden we coached and we coached where we're working 80, 90 hours a week all the time over and over. And you don't realize until you step away that what you were doing was like, oh my gosh, that's, I don't know if really if that was sustainable because we, because I know when I stepped away a little bit, it was for my family. I still would beat myself up a little bit about that. I'm like, I can't believe I'm not doing that. It was like, I, it, you can't do the 90 hours plus this and, and be, and be hundred percent for both. You know, I can't be hundred percent with the club, hundred percent with my family. And so someone is always, I felt getting cheated, but then also when you step away, you, you and I hear that from swimmers all the way. What's your identity now? People, you know, you're at a college party. Like, what are you like swimmer? First thing you'd say is you wouldn't right. even say I'm a chem major or whatever. It's like, you're a swimmer. And then when you stop swimming, yeah. like, what are you? I don't know. Now you stop your coaching. Like, what are you? at least you, like right now you're, you're a consultant and you can kind of move into that. But it, for, I think for a lot of us that step away from whatever it is that you gave so much to, and especially it's not like at the end of the day, you built a house. It's like you, you helped with a lot of lives and you don't always get to see that. And you just kind of hope that. And every now and then you get a card 20, 30 years you know, down the line, like, okay, I did really build a house. I really did something pretty effective. Um, but overall, you know, I think making change is, is going to make people, better off and happier you know if, if you make a change yeah. let's say that you know if something doesn't go like you'd hoped it at least you tried and i think if you never tried then you're always thinking oh this could have worked this could have done this could have done this or you go off and you do something like this which i think you're gonna do really well at and it's gonna do uh, great things and you're gonna look back and go like man i don't know how i did 20 years like that but i think at the end you know you, you've got a great job at wahoos but if the passion is 100 percent there then then it, it's better to do it when, you know, just as your passion's leaving. It's like my wife will say all the time about it. Yeah. Divorce is no one ever gets divorced at the right moment. Like I told her one day, I was like, Hey honey, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> I think about taking, taking up golf, you know? And she said, great. That'd be awesome. Cause then we can get divorced right now without all the fighting. And like, what is right. like, <laughs> you're gone every Saturday during the winter for these college meets. This is the summer. You're going to be gone every Saturday and Sunday for golf. Yeah, let's yeah. just get divorced now yeah. or we still like each other. Right, <laughs> so no one, right. no one ever gets divorced when they like each other when they should. <laughs> it's after, you know, about 10 years too late. And so the idea, again, yeah. it's, it's best to do this move and um, really happy for you and excited that you can kind of uh, go 100% into what you're passionate about. Yeah. And I, I have to say I'm grateful to be able to leave on really good terms. And I probably overestimated how upset people would be at me, I would say, um, because I think that's just a natural thing to do sure. when you're nervous about a decision and people overwhelmingly have been extremely kind, um, through this. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I, and I appreciate all their support and I appreciate your support as well, Joel. Um, that's all we got for the podcast this week. Thank you to everybody for listening. Um, we are on our way to setting a, another new record for listeners this month. So uh, on top of everything else, I'm grateful. I'm really grateful for that. I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday season. Um, I'm looking forward to celebrating Danish Christmas tomorrow. And, um, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening. And, and we'll be back maybe next week. We haven't even talked about yeah. it yet, but we'll, we'll yeah, figure but it out. Hopefully, and again, we're just kind of um, this idea of warm up and things. We, we just started kind of talking about this week and kind of the idea of including what you do with, it with yeah. positive coaching, but the idea of the physiology and also the perception behind. So anyone that's listening, um, if you have any ideas where we can kind of keep on going and building off of this, we'd really appreciate you to comment, call Chris, email yes. Chris. Yes, please, please engage. Uh, yeah. especially me. Um, Chris, 
Chris D underscore coach on Instagram, Chris DeSantis coaching on Facebook, of course, uh, YouTube, Spotify, uh, iTunes, the swim brief, and, uh, see you guys soon. Bye. Bye. -bye.